Hey everyone, a very good morning to all of you. Myself Neha Gupta, your mentor for current affairs. So I welcome you all in this video that is specifically catering to the RBI Seven Awards Phase One Current Affairs. So before moving ahead, let me inform you that you can download this PDF through our Telegram channel, and the link of the channel is in description below. So let's move ahead with our first question. Which organization has launched the State of World's Land and Water Resources for Food and Agriculture report? So this is the entire title of the report. As you can see, we have five options out of which Food and Agriculture Organization, which is a UN specialized organization based in Rome, Italy. This organization has released this report. So this report basically focuses on the soil, water and land resources and how we have degraded them to the extent that they become insufficient to satiate our food demands by the year 2050. So that's the focal point of this report. But this report also has many other points to deliver to you all. But before moving into this report, let me clarify that the people right now are watching me, particularly if any one of you is an award aspirant who has given mails right now and interview is still pending, then guys, this report can be of use for you uh, optimally. So watch this carefully, okay? because there are high chances that uh, this can become a question in your interview as well. This is the very latest report released by you. Okay, so as far as the facts related to this report are concerned, so it had a subheading kind of a thing that is systems at breaking point, which in itself highlights that it's the uh, very high time that the uh, countries across the world should wake up and humans across the world should wake up to the exploitation of land, soil, and water. Okay, so by 2050, the global population is expected to reach 9.7 billion. And the uh, resources that we have, land, soil, and water, are not capable to satiate human demands, human food demands by uh, 2050. Therefore, it is high time that we should wake up to the call of the nature to restore the resources, to stop the over-exploitation of those resources. So these are the key findings of the reports. Let's have a look at these statements. First statement, the first key finding says that land and water systems are under pressure. Advances in food systems require focusing on land, soils and water as interconnected systems. So this is a very basic point. I don't think that you need to pay uh, any extra effort to memorize this point. It's a very basic point and you can also cite this in one of your answers in ESI if any answer on climate change or the environment comes, okay? Because the over-exploitation of land, soil and water is also due to climate change. I'll come to that point when we'll discuss this point, okay? Climate change where they have given a specific bullet also. So that is also one of the key findings. Second point says that current patterns of intensification are not proving sustainable. High levels of pollution and greenhouse gas emissions are stretching the productive capacity to the limit and severely degrading the land and environmental services. So again, this is a very basic point that pollution and greenhouse gas emissions are impacting the resources. They are degrading the land and other services of the environment. Third point is climate change. Evapotranspiration is expected to increase, okay, and alter the quality, quantity, and distribution of rainfall, leading to changes in land crops suitability and greater variations in river runoff and groundwater recharge. So basically, Due to the climate change, evapotranspiration is going to increase. What is evapotranspiration? Evapotranspiration basically refers to the, uh, to the release of water from the surface of land as well as plants. Okay, because here, this is a portmanteau word, guys, that has been created after merging two different words, evaporation and transpiration. On this specific term only, I have uh, specified it, I have defined it in the GK factory section. But the GK factory does not only have this section, it has a lot for you all. 
okay so wait till the end to understand it in detail but as far as the understanding of this report is concerned you can understand it that the release of water from land and plants is evaporation okay evaporation evaporation plus transpiration and this is going to enhance due to the climate change and if the uh, amount of water that is released in the atmosphere increases then obviously rainfall uh, the chances of rainfall will increase and that too very is in a very asymmetric pattern okay for example in the area where the rainfall is needed there i guess there would be no uh, evapotranspiration because for example rajasthan you can take the example of rajasthan how much evapotranspiration would be there in rajasthan in comparison to a coastal area of andhra pradesh so that's the difference here on the one hand where the rainfall is needed there would be less and less rainfall and on the other hand the areas which are very prone to floods there would be more and more evapotranspiration and which will lead to rainfall so this is also impacting the land soil and water resources now guys this report also has some facts and these facts are particularly important if you are appearing for nabard interview and there are some facts that can even be asked in your rg examination also particularly in esi and ard for nabard students so the first point here is grasslands and shrub covered areas have declined by 191 million hectares over two decades to stand at 3196 million hectares in 2019 so grassland shrub covered areas that are particularly acting as the fodder for the animals stand at 3196 million hectares in 2019 this is the uh, exact uh, amount of land available to the animals grassland and shrub covered areas have been converted to crop land okay that's why we are witnessing a decrease in the grassland and shrub covered areas the crop lands increased by 4% to 63 million hectares between 2000 to 2019 okay population increase have meant agricultural land availability per capita for crops and animal husbandry declined by 20% between 20 between 2000 to 2017 to 0.19 hectare per capita in 2017 now let me simplify this one population is increasing now due to the increase in the human population the availability of land for crops and for animal husbandry that is decreasing now this availability is being measured in terms of per capita okay so per capita availability of land for crops and animal husbandry is decreasing and the reason for this decrease is population human population increase now this decrease is by 20% and the actual amount in 2017 how much per capita land was available for agricultural crops and animal grazing was this 0.19 hectare per capita in 2017 so guys this is an important figure okay so this can be asked from you even if you are phase 1 of rbi and sebi examinations not particularly sebi but in rbi to they can ask because you have 80 questions in your phase 1 from current affairs only so obviously out of 80 this can get a space of one question only okay so it can become a question Although cropland covers only 13% of the total land mass of the globe, degraded cropland covers 29% of the total degraded land. Okay, so these are two different statements, clubbed into one. So first statement is saying that out of the total land mass, 13% of the land mass is cropland, and out of those, out of that 13%, 29% is the degraded cropland. So that's the entire meaning of this statement. moving ahead almost a third of the rain fed cropland and nearly a half of the irrigated land is subject to human induced land degradation again a very simple point now all of this has led to food insecurity and food insecurity is leading to undernourishment of people so the number of people who are undernourished has risen to 768 million in 2020 as per this report in comparison to 604 million in 
by 2050 agriculture will need to produce almost 50% more food livestock fodder and biofuel than in 2012 to satisfy global demand and keep on track to achieve zero hunger by 2030 okay so we are saying that whatever we are producing right now we need to almost uh increase it by 50% by the year 2050 but on the other hand the resources that are used to increase or used to generate food are degrading and degrading at a very rapid pace so this is anomalous how are we going to uh, uh satiate human demand human and animal food demand by 2050 that's the question uh, that's the uh, question of the art that needs to be addressed by the governments across the uh, across the world and also individuals moving on to the next question recently nasa's juno spacecraft has captured electromagnetic waves from uh, ganymede which is a jupiter's sun which is a moon of jupiter not sun which of the following quality makes ganymede distinct from the other moons in the solar system presence of water high presence of nickel presence of heavy ice sheets magnetic field presence of sulfur so guys here the right answer is magnetic field so this is the only moon in the entire solar system that has its own magnetic field another very interesting fact related to this moon of jupiter is that like its planet it is also the largest moon in the entire solar system so these are the two very interesting facts and salient features of this moon but why is it in the news this is in the question itself because the nasa's juno mission has captured the electromagnetic waves from this moon and nasa has transferred or converted that electromagnetic uh, waves into sound so that's the particular news right now but what is the juno mission from where a question can become question can be framed for your examination so let's discuss that but before that let's have a look at this ganymede i told you that it's the largest a uh, solar system it is even bigger than the size of the mercury okay which is in itself a planet yeah. okay i have told you this thing scientists believe that ganymede has oceans below the ice on its surface which can sustain life okay so there is a question were those electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic waves sent by aliens are they are are they are living organisms living on this ganymede moon so that's the question that the scientists are exploring right now moving ahead to the juno mission so nasa has sent its juno mission in 2012 and in july uh, july or june 2021 i don't remember the exact month and you also need not to memorize that no just the years so this was the lifeline lifetime of juno mission and in 2021 juno has completed its mission successfully but it has got extension till 2025 or till the end of the spacecraft life okay now what is the purpose so the purpose is to study jupiter its moons its rings and by studying jupiter which is the largest planet of the solar system the scientists are are trying to quench their thirst for the answer how was the universe how was the solar system evolved so that's the kind of uh, query that they are right now pursuing uh, and juno mission is for that only it is basically studying jupiter but the basic purpose is to know the origins of the solar system by studying jupiter its moons and its rings now we know that jupiter has the ma maximum amounts of moon maximum number of moons can you guys now tell me the total number of moons that jupiter has in the comment section below moving ahead currently the juno mission is studying the planet its uh, galilean moons i hope you all are um, acquainted with galileo galilei so from him uh, this name is given to the these three moons ganymede europa and io so let me show you where juno is at present this is the jupiter planet this is io moon this is ganymede this is europa okay so this is the juno spacecraft of nasa and from here it received the electromagnetic waves moving ahead which one of the following space agency is sponsoring the microage experiment 
यूरोपियन स्पेस एजेंसी नासा रॉस कॉस्मोस यूके स्पेस एजेंसी जाक्सा द राइट आंसर इज ऑप्शन डी यूके स्पेस एजेंसी uh is sponsoring the micro age experiment now what is this micro age experiment don't go into the statements don't read the statements just listen to me carefully okay so basically what the scientists have done they have just captured human cells and they have kept those human cells within a 3d kind of a pack 3d kind of a capsule and they have sent it to international space station now after reaching the iss this capsule will be charged with electric waves with electricity basically to see the reaction of human cells and tissues now what are they going to do by studying the reaction of cells in space by giving them electric charge so okay so this from here arises the question about the need of this experiment so the need of this experiment is that the astronaut it has been observed that the astronauts who have been living at the iss international space station they their muscles are rapidly aging okay they are losing their muscles do you know how many hours do they exercise on a particular day they daily exercise for 2.5 hours but still they are losing their muscles and when they return back to earth they are very uh, they become very incapable incapable to walk for a long distance so that's how the aging is they are facing the phenomenon of aging in the space and in order to study how the human cells are aging in space this experiment is being done okay so basically they are going to study the aging phenomenon from the name itself micro age aging phenomenon is going to be studied and what is the need i have already told you so let's have a look at the facts here now uk space agency is sponsoring this project uh, micro age experiment uh, which will be sent via spacex falcon 9 rocket it will be sent through kennedy space center in florida us okay next is that the researchers who are going to study about it belong to the university of liverpool so where i have written it okay it is here okay so the researchers belong to the university of liverpool so uk is sponsoring it us has sent it not exactly the government of us is involved it's the private company spacex so it is sending the uh, the 3d model the 3d capsule to the iss on its falcon 9 rocket from the kennedy space center so that's the entire experiment all about moving ahead which state has announced to launch the happiness curriculum in the primary schools from the next session 2022 to 2023 the right answer here is uttar pradesh okay so this happiness curriculum will be for the classes of first to eighth it is the third state after chatisgarh and delhi to introduce this happiness curriculum how many districts are present in nagaland the right answer is 15 recently three new districts have been created in nagaland which makes the total number of districts in nagaland 15 okay so that's the last question now it's the time for the gk factory guys if you remember i told you in the first question only that evapotranspiration is one term that i'm going to discuss in the gk factory section today okay but it is not only the first term not only term that i'm going to discuss i have taken a total number of five important terms related to the climate change related to climate only that can be of use for you and i hope that you enjoy learning those terms okay i hope that it is visible so the very first term is bioaccumulation do you know what is bioaccumulation bioaccumulation refers to the accumulation the gathering of pollutant within one species okay so as from this picture you can see that this is the baby fish that is born right now then it go grows up it grows up it grows up to its full stage now this blue color is showing you the contamination levels okay suppose it has uh, eaten something now then it has grown up it has consumed more and more of that uh, 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 more of that food okay uh, then it has grown up to this stage and the level of contamination is also increasing so this is bioaccumulation that is happening within one tropic level trophic level okay so this is the trophic level bio accumulation only happens at the trophic level but do pay attention to this thing that the level of contamination is increasing as the fish is growing up okay so this is the 
accumulation level. Now I'm going to tell you about biomagnification as well. What is biomagnification? This is the same concept accumulation of pollutant but here the pollutant is being transferred from one tropic level to another tropic level of the food chain i hope that you are very well aware of the uh, tropic levels of food chain even if you are not i have put an image here so that uh, you can just have a look and revise the concept of the tropic levels okay so uh, let's take the example from here only for example we have spread ddt or any kind of insecticide in the plant okay the farmers have done that then this plant has absorbed that insecticide and that is also a pollutant okay for the plant as well as for the upper species then it is eaten by the herbivores like this rabbit has eaten this plant so obviously it is going to intake the the pollutant that is there the contaminate contaminant that is there in the plant and it is not uh, possible that this rabbit will only eat one plant. It will eat many plants. Thus, the level of accumulation of pollutant in this rabbit will increase in comparison to the level of pollute contamination that was there in the plant. Okay. For example, if the plant has plant has this much of contamination, then it will increase to this much at the second stage. Then when this is eaten by the fish, the level of contamination is increasing. So what is the difference here, the difference between bioaccumulation and biomagnification? The basic difference is that in biomagnification, the level also increases, but at the same time, it is also transferred from one tropic level to another tropic level. I hope that it is clear. Now, what are we doing about it? we have an international treaty at the global level which is known as the stockholm convention on, Pers on persistent organic pollutants which was adopted in 2001 but came into effect in 2004 okay so there is a bit of confusion regarding this convention that when was it adopted or when was it uh, came when did it came come into force so do remember 2001 was the year in which it was adopted 2004 implemented Okay, so this particular Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutant aims to eliminate the use of persistent organic pollutants. What are the persistent organic pollutant? Pollutants that are organic, basically the pollutants that remain in the environment for a long period of time that are not subject to biodegradation. There are certain kinds of pollutants that degrade themselves, but on the other hand, these POPs are the pollutants which do not degrade uh, for a long period of time. They remain in the environment and harm the living organisms as well as the environment itself. Okay, so some examples of the POPs are the PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. Now, this is basically a kind of waste generated by the industries. Okay, so this convention aims to ban the, the release of PCBs into the environment as well as DDT insecticides okay so these are the some of the examples which this convention seeks to ban but there is a list of POPs that is there in this list uh, that is there in this convention that this convention aims to ban I hope that now the difference between bioaccumulation and magnification is clear to you again I will show you the food chain okay so from this rabbit is eaten by this frog for example then frog or let's say this is eaten by this frog now the level of contamination is transferred in this frog but at the same time it is not going to eat only one beetle it will also eat many beetles thus the intensity of the contaminant will also increase in frog and thus it goes up to the top level okay now the section does not end here we have two more terms and at the last we have evapotranspiration okay so land degradation and land desertification so this entire gk factor section today is not at all directly related but indirectly they all are part of the climate and climate change is one issue that is right now a two sword edge for the entire world okay it's the high time that we need to work on it and also at it is the high time that you also need to pay attention to the terms related to climate and environment so land degradation what is degradation degradation is the process of deterioration of soil or the loss of fertility of the soil it can be defined as the deterioration of the 
or the loss of the productive capacity of the soils for present and future. Okay, so land degradation in some simple terms, degradation of the topsoil. Okay, because if the topsoil is degraded, we cannot cultivate uh, anything on that land. So land degradation is a precursor of land desertification. I'll come to land desertification, but let's first look at the causes of this. Natural hazards like soil erosion on steep slopes, anthropogenic causes like the human induced causes, like we use many kind of insecticide, pesticides, as we discussed before, they also increase the salinity of the soil, thus they also degrade the land, they also make the land incapable of producing any kind of crops. Okay, so these are some of the causes. Actually, these natural hazards and anthropogenic hazards or the activities have encompassed all kinds of causes that can be there for land degradation. Now let's discuss what land desertification is. So here, land degradation is a precursor of land desertification. So obviously, it is a subset of this. First, the land is degraded. Then that land is degraded to this extent that it becomes a desert. Okay, Panjar ho jana zameen ka is land desertification. Okay, so here it is a type of land degradation in dry lands in which biological productivity is lost due to natural processes or induced by human activities, whereby fertile areas become increasingly arid. So completely Panjar ho jana zameen ka that no possible plantation or any kind of green vegetation sur can survive on this land okay so that is desertification causes climate change uh, change and over exploitation of soil by humans all the causes that are there in land degradation can be applied to land desertification also but what are we doing to stop this because in the first question also we discussed that land soil matlab soil uh, land and water these are the three resources that we are over exploiting at by the year 2050 we need to increase the food production but at the same time the level of degradation of the land is so high that god knows how it will be possible how will we grow the food by the year 2050 so we have un convention to combat desertification which came into effect in 1994 Okay, so this is basically the convention, the international treaty that aims to stop land degradation and desertification. The major focus is on desertification as of now. So this is the only sole legally binding international treaty. Again, do remember it is legally binding. Okay, majority of the treaties, conventions, conferences are not legally binded. They are, they work on voluntary basis, but it is legally binding. And it is linking the environment and development to sustainable land management. Okay, so environment and development is only possible when we have sustainable land management. As you also read in the first question itself, the report of the FAU also says that if we want to prosper, the over exploitation of the land should be stopped. Okay, that was also one of the contentions made by that report. The new UN double CD 2018 to 2030 strategic framework is the most comprehensive global commitment to achieve land degradation neutrality. So here we are also talking about the land degradation, stopping the land degradation and stopping the land desertification at the same time. What are the commitments by the world and, the, and India? So countries across the world have committed to restore 1 billion hectares of land by 2030. Now, how are they going to do that? This is still, uh, uh, this is still to be seen by the time, okay? UN decade on ecosystem restoration is 2021 to 2030. Therefore, this has pushed the countries across the world to increase their land restoration targets. India's land restoration target is 26 million hectares by 2030. Earlier it was 21 million hectares, but India increased it to 26 million hectares. Again, the question remains the same. How are we going to do that? Nobody knows. Okay, so this is the last term that I'm going to discuss with you, evapotranspiration. I told you that it is the release of moisture, the release of water from the land as well as from the plants. So that is transpiration plus evaporation comes out as evapotranspiration. So what do we get to know from evapotranspiration? 
Evapotranspiration basically is the index of thermal efficiency of an area. What is thermal efficiency? Thermal efficiency basically refers to the heat of the area, the heated atmosphere of the area. How much heat that is received from the sun, how much effectively an area is receiving heat from the sun and how much evapotranspiration is done from uh, in done in that area is done in that area it represents the amount of transfer of moisture to the atmosphere by soil and plants so that's all about ev evapotranspiration i hope that today's session would be useful for you and if it is then do not forget to subscribe our channel thank you so much for watching the video